that you got out in the mess today to be here. Welcome to those of you who are at home and dry and watching online. If you would, please stand. I need my kids to come here to help me talk about a great big God that we have.
so much, kids. appreciate you helping with that. You'll get to go to your classes here in just a moment. Let me just uh, remind you of a few things in our worship folder here. And um, those of you at home, glad that you are there. If you wouldn't mind, say hi in the comments or give us a thumbs up. We'd love to know that you are there. And if you want to participate in the Lord's Supper a little bit later on, if you'll have your communion supplies close at hand, you can do that. If you're here in the house, um, if you haven't yet, um, in just a moment, we stand up and take a, a, a good morning break. Um, there's a station up front or in the two back corners for you to get your communion supplies and bring back to your seats. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, also do the tear-off strip here and let us know that you are with us. Um, there's a box back by the sound booth. You can drop that in at the end. Um, and if you're a guest with us, you can let that be your offering to us today, or you can leave that in your seat as well, and we'll find it there. We are supposed to be kicking off our school supply collection today. I totally forgot about it until yesterday. Um, it's in the bulletin. It's in the newsletter. The list is there. I will try next week to have a handout for, <clears throat> handout for that. Uh, we have 60 teachers to provide for. Um, so basically wipes, hand sanitizers, paper towels, tissues, dry erase markers, and $10 gift cards um, for them. We want to put in there, and I'll have some cards for us to sign uh, in the next coming weeks that we'll put in the, 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 the sacks that we give them as well. There's uh, a couple of things coming up. Uh, in a couple of Sundays, there's going to be a, an, an evening meeting for those who are interested in talking to the people who want to use our property to put a, a connector trail for the thread trail. That's going to be on Sunday night, the 24th, so two, three Sundays away. Two Sundays away uh, for that. And then the following Sunday, the last Sunday of the month, there's a baby shower for Kayla Barfield. Actually, it's for her baby, although the baby won't be using I mean, anyway, it'll be for them. Um, but there's a sign-up. You can check off here. Or there's a sign-up sheet in the back for those if you're interested in doing that. At this time, our kids and teachers can be dismissed to their classes next door. And the rest of us, if we want, stand up, say hello to each other, wave to the camera, and let everybody know that uh, you're here. Good morning.
God Almighty, there is power in the name of Jesus. That at his name, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess. But Father, we know that in the name of Jesus, um, those that are weak are made strong. Those that are hopeless are restored and given hope. Father God, we come today because of what your son did on the cross. By dying there for our sins, but also by conquering it, defeating it, and coming back to life. So that we sing with confidence in the mighty power of the name of Jesus. Father, may you bless us today as we learn from your word. Father, may you be with the kids next door as they worship and as they learn. May you speak to them uh, these truths from your Bible. Father, we want to lift you up and tell you what an awesome, wonderful, majestic, merciful God that you are. We love you so much. We pray this in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're at that time in our service that we remember Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection by taking the Lord's Supper. Um, again, if you've not gotten your communion and brought to your seats, uh, now is the time to do that. Because we're going to sing this song, Behold the Lamb of God. It's, a, it's actually a short song. Um, but following that, Curtis is going to come and share some thoughts, take us closer to the cross. And he'll lead us in taking the Lord's Supper. And then we'll sing another song to close out this time together. Um, if you're watching at home, you're invited as well to participate. If you would like to do that, uh, but listen to what you're about to sing, what Curtis is going to share, and prepare to do as Jesus instructed, and remember him in this way. of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen and was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through, through which he was commended as righteous. By faith, Eunuch was taken up so that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverence, fear, constructed an ark to save him of his household. By faith, Abraham obeyed God when he was called to go to a place that he was to receive an inheritance. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, 
as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. By faith, herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. All the, all, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on this earth. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish when those who were disobedient because she gave a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail of Gideon, Samson, David, Samuel, the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness because the mighty, mighty in war put foreigner armies to flight. Women received back their dead by the resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mockings, floggings, even chains, imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were killed with swords. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, though, though through, condemned through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that part from us they should not be made perfect. Though, though we, through faith, we celebrate communion with the foreknowledge that this world has nothing for us, but we celebrate the life that comes after through faith, we are looking for a city on a hill whose builder is God. My thought for communion is this. Faith leads to grace. Grace is the path of salvation. Salvation puts us in the presence of God. Something to think about as we pass the bread and cup. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we see the faith of those who came before Christ. And here we are on the other side of the veil. We get to stand before your presence. Our faith can be as that of a mustard seed, and yet we are called the heirs of God. How much more should we rejoice to celebrate the death and the burial and the resurrection of your Son, that someday we will be where you are. It is in the only name under heaven and earth, the only name in which men must be saved, the only power that's known to mankind, the name of Jesus we give praise. Amen. <laughs> This is the bread of life. Through faith, we take it together. This juice represents the blood that was poured out upon Calvary's cross. Let us take it together as well.
Please turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. We'll start there in a few moments, and then later in the message, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, those are going to be on page 61 and 952, respectively, in the Bibles and the, um, the seats in front of you there. Um, Exodus 20 and 1 Corinthians 1. Why are there so many different religions in the world? Deep down, aren't they really just the same? Don't they all just tell us how to be better people and, and point us to, to God? And while we're at it, why are there so many different Christian denominations? I mean, really, aren't they all the same? We all believe in and love Jesus, right? I mean, that's, that's what everybody tells us, right? And that's what really matters deep down. <laughs> These are the common comments, misperceptions that people have. One religion is just as good as another. And why can't we all just coexist and get along? I don't understand that either. Or we get, you know, there's just so many of them. It's just so confusing. I'm not going to mess with any of them. They're either all the same or they're all equally wrong. So what does it matter? Um, this summer we're in a series that I've called What's the Deal? And it's just a collection of topics that over the years I've heard people question. And we've talked about predestination, the Old Testament, Trinity, today denominations and religions, next week faith and works, and, and on there on the list of just some, some different things that people have, have said over the years and maybe a way to explain them or talk about them or, and, and cover them. And some of these are, are, are kind of difficult and quite honestly not things that I enjoy talking about because... They're so easily misunderstood and misused. And, and some of them, the Bible does not have a clear statement about them, or at least there's not enough, there's enough on both sides that, that it still remains somewhat confusing or not easily settled. We started with predestination, and, and the word predestined is in the Bible. And a lot of people take that word and, and put some different meanings to it, and so it becomes confusing. We try to explain it, people go, well, it's in the Bible, it says it there, so... That's what I mean by it's not always clear cut. They're not always easy topics to discuss. Today's topic is no different. <laughs> Denominations and other religions. It's one that touches people often personally. Many of us know people who are not saved because they just ignore what the Bible says. Or some who hold different beliefs than we do. And there are just so many opinions out there in the world. It's just easy to say, well, well Scott, that's just your opinion too. I'm really not interested in telling you my opinion, though. I, I want to, I hope to show you what the Bible says. Now, let's lighten the mood a little bit. This is kind of a heavy, dark, heavy topic. Did I say heavy twice because it's kind of heavy in, in places, all right? So let's kind of lighten it up a little bit, although some of y'all sent some heavy stuff in as well. I ask you to send in... Uh, things that divide, because we're going to talk about religions and denominations that divide us, and so I ask you to send in things that are divided. Um, and I got a bunch in this morning, so uh, Melissa Manners sent in that highways are divided. She took a picture of um, her exit. Highways pointed to the north, go home to family or south to her new home. So actually, I got a lot of divided roads kind of things. I tried to do um, what people, the, the, the things people said similar, but I got I lost, so um, anyway. Um, John Barfield sent in, we drive on divided highways, there you have it again, and numbers, you can divide numbers, which is kind of, but I got a lot of those as well. Um, Carolyn sent in things that are divided, sandwiches, uh, that's it, somebody else said that, lanes and highways, there we go again with the highways, the Pacific Ocean from the Atlantic Ocean, I had another one of those coming up, countries, that was a popular one, you know, Canada separated from the United States or divided from, political parties are divided, that's another one that people talked about, and the northern and southern hemispheres divide the globe, very good, I said one, she sent in seven, it's okay, all right. Shannon Gardner sent in eggs are divided. I, I found a recipe where it said three eggs divided. Um, if you've never cooked like that, then that's what that, that is. Um, Ashley Lozier sent in, this is kind of silly, but the first thing that comes to mind is numbers. It's not silly because other people said it, Ashley. Um, or pies or cakes or pizzas. Food is divided and time is divided also. Mary Pustrom sent in way late last night that time is divided, but so late that it didn't make it into today's message. So, Debbie Wilkinson, um, actually Brian had said this too, but he said uh, South Carolina and Clemson, um, but the, the, the license plates are saying the house divided UNC and, and, and Duke. Matt Memrick also sent that in, um, and she sent in divided plates. I don't know if you can, can you see, yeah, you can see that up there, the divisions up there. 
I have a story about that in a minute. Um, Brenda Patterson also sent in divided plates. Or maybe I'm going to tell you this story now. Let me tell you this story real quick. Um, my dad's father, my grandpa, my dad's father's brother, so it's my dad's uncle. His name's Don. Um, and I don't know if my grandpa and his brother are working at the same place, but my grandpa's telling me a story about Don. Don hated for his food to touch. He did not like for his food to, some of y'all are like that, so you don't understand. They don't like his food to touch. So my grandpa was telling me about it, and I said, oh, you know, at school we have these plates in the cafeteria with dividers on it. He would love that. He said, oh, no, he hates those. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said when he was working at Fontana Dam, the cafeteria there had the divided plates, and he hated it because the cooks or the people who serving it would often slop the food over the edge of the divider so the peas would get into the mashed potatoes, and now it's divided and stuck over there. He absolutely hated the divided plates. So. Um, anyway, so when some of y'all put it into divided plates, it made me think of my, my Uncle Don and his hatred of divided plates because his food touched and he didn't like it when it was divided. Um, Amanda Wall also sent in, our house is divided because Lily loves Carolina and Chris and I are huge Duke fans. There's another house divided thing. And also John bought me a tray with divided slots so my food doesn't touch. It's the best. That's, that's where I was supposed to tell the story. I knew there was another one coming up. Kayla sent in that politics are divided. Even when parties agree on something, they find a reason not to agree. And how true is that? Um, Brenda sent in um, North and South Korea. I got a couple of those. Um, this quote, um, the things that divide us are far less important than those that connect us. That's a really good quote. And if you all remember a few years ago, um, this dress made the, the rounds on the internet. Is it blue? Is it brown? I think is what it was or something like that. But uh, the, the dress that divided the internet. Um, my, my wife sent in the bundling boards of the Amish. <laughs> uh, the Tulluris. Preeti said nostrils are divided. They're the same, but they're separated. Grace sent in, um, who, eat, who eats more mangoes, Hispanics or Indians? I don't know, because they both like mangoes, because they both like something, but they're divided, two different peoples there. But then she said this, everybody say separate. Did you notice that your lips did not separate? Separate, your lips come together. But when you say together, your lips do not come together. They actually don't touch. Um, they are separated, not actually divided. So Grace was very creative with her <laughs> stuff there. And Benjamin sent in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. They meet together, but they are separate. Very good. Mary Jane sent in, uh, numbers are divided, pies and cakes, pizza is divided, I'm getting hungry now, and property is divided. Oops, the Vi, ooh, I sh the Vi sent in, Republicans, Democrats, politics again, numbers is in math, numbers got a big one. Um, countries and nations, North and South Korea again, uh, food, half sandwich, slice of pizza, y'all are thinking the same. Husband, oh, this is dark, this is hard. Husbands and wives, as in their spending habits, how they discipline children, and their divorce, they're divided. Wow. Um, and candy, as in break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar, is divided. At least you lighten the mood after all that heavy stuff there with the, the Kit Kat bar. <laughs> Matt Memrick sent this in, the, the, the divided hair. Um. Sonia Myers watching from um, uh, Wisconsin. She was one of the first ones that sent in the numbers, and so I put up there, she's an engineer, so she thinks this way, but a bunch of y'all think this way too. She said, things that divide a calculator and an abacus divide. Um, and she thought that was funny because that's the way her mind thinks, but a bunch of you think that way too. But then she sent this in. I, I wanted to end on this one. Um, COVID divided more than anything I have experienced in my lifetime. Masked versus unmasked, vaccine versus no vaccine, distance versus no social distance. It made me sad because people had a hard time allowing others' choices. It became, if you don't agree with me, then you're not worthy of my fill-in-the-blank. My still being a member of, of your family um, or coming into my house, things like that. But I have to leave with this, Philippians 4, 8, declare my thoughts on division. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I thought that was very good. Y'all did a, a very good job with things that are divided. Next week, I want your favorite duo, all right? can be anything, peanut butter and jelly, you know, things that go together. Or 
you know, Abbott and Costello, a pair. Anything that, 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 that has to do with pairs or twos, the number two. We did the number three a few weeks ago last week. We can do the number two if you want. So uh, duos, because we're going to talk about faith and works next week. So things that go together kind of thing. You got that? That's your assignment. All right. All right, so let's get back to what's the deal with religion and denominations. And let's start with other religions. I did a quick internet search this week. And it said, Google said that there are about 10,000 different distinguishable religions in the world today. 10,000 different ones. Now, we know some of the major ones, but uh, in, 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 in some third world countries, every little tribe has their own religion kind of thing is where we get up to the 10,000 different ones. Um, here's just a little infographic about um, the, the breakdown just to give you an idea of some of the major ones uh, that are out there. Um, no wonder there's so much confusion, and, and there is. And I, again, I, I, I thought, well, let me, let me just see what people are saying about how all of these religions. And, and so I found a popular place on the Internet that, that people go to get answers to questions. And someone had asked, why are there so many religions in the world? And the vast majority of those who responded said either, well, they're all the same, or they're all equally wrong. I highlighted one. He says, um, whoever this guy is, uh, simple, they're all wrong. That's his answer to why are there so many religions in the world. Oh, they're all wrong. Um, but then there are other, somebody else had posted this, this, this thing. I'm going to show this to you a little bit later on. You know, according to current records, Hindus are the oldest, blah, 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 blah. You know, they're all the same. They're all based on the same thing. All religions are the same. I think that's the prevailing attitude or opinion among those who are not religious at all and among a, a, a growing number of non-committed religious people. Some of the comments were hostile in nature, and what I mean, there was very little, let, let's just let people believe what they want to believe, and more of um, all religions are scams and need to be abolished. So much for let's all get along in tolerance, isn't it? Now, I don't think that people who post a reply on Quora, that's a particular website, represent everybody, but then again, Quora is a place that a lot of people go for questions to get their questions answered about anything in life, including religion. So that's what people think. I don't know how many people actually believe it, but, but who knows? So why are there so many, 10,000 and counting? Let's go to the Bible. What's the very first commandment? And God spoke, this is a, a Exodus chapter 20. Um, let me read this to you, verses 1 through 3. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who, thought, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Why that commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. Well, because it was a problem. The people of Israel, at the writing of Exodus chapter 20, or the events of Exodus chapter 20, they had spent 430 years in Egypt, a land where there were gods for everything. And I mean everything in Egypt. Um, I was reading something, I think they had a god, goddess of the hinges, things that make the doors open and shut. A goddess of hinges in, in Egypt. They had gods for everything there. So Israel had been surrounded by gods. They had, they had gods for the Nile, for flies, for frogs, for fertility. And the ten plagues were designed in part to show Yahweh's supremacy over those so-called Egyptian gods. So for 400 years, Israel was surrounded by a people who worshipped other gods. And prior to that and after that too, Israel was surrounded by nations who worshipped other gods. Abraham, the father of Israel, came from Ur, which archaeologists have uncovered and discovered that this was a place where there were multiple gods. So as the very first commandment, Yahweh says, you shall have no other gods before me. You see, he alone is to be worshipped. I'm going to use Yahweh a lot because if I just say God, it'll get confusing over God and the living God versus the gods that other people worship. Now we're going to come back to Mount Sinai in just a moment, but I want to fast forward through the Old Testament just a little bit. As I said, Israel had been and would be surrounded by other nations who worshipped other gods. Even when Jesus comes, Rome is in charge of Palestine. And Rome uh, had adopted a lot of the Greek gods and they have their own gods. And so there's these Roman and Greek gods all over the place. And in the Old Testament, 
There were gods such as Molech and Chemosh, who among other things required human sacrifice. I don't want to give you the gory, vulgar details, but parents would sacrifice their babies to these statues in the Old Testament. It was despicable and evil. The Roman and Greek gods, or at least the legends and myths of them, were replete with stories of rape and incest and warring between them and betrayal and murder. You read the stories of the Greek and Roman gods and, and it's awful. In, in other words, I want to point this out. All gods are not the same. All these, all these religions are all the same. No, they're not. Yahweh has nothing in common with, with Molech. Nothing at all. We come to the modern world and we still see this. Allah, as believed by the Muslim world, would have you kill your adversaries, the infidels as they call them. That's, that's his solution. If you remember Jim Jones of the late 1970s and the People Temple, his religion ended in mass murder and suicide in Jonestown, Guyana. 909 people, 300 and some of them were children. David Koresh and the Branch Davidians in 1993. All gods are not the same. No matter what people in Korah say, they are not. All right, let's return to Mount Sinai. Moses has gone up to the mountain to receive the law, including the Ten Commandments, which the first was, you shall have no other gods before me. And when Moses comes down from the mountain with the law from God and the tablets, we have this scene from Exodus chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up. Make us gods who will go, shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hands and fashioned it with a, a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, look at this, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt, the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And you're probably familiar with the story of the golden calf. Moses has been on the mountain. He comes down and they're worshiping this golden calf. But you may not have noticed this before. The golden calf was intended to be a way to worship Yahweh. That's what Aaron says. Tomorrow will be a feast to the Lord. And if you remember, I've told you this before in your Bibles, when you see the word Lord in the Old Testament that's in all caps, it, it, it's the word Yahweh. It's the proper name of God. They just don't translate it. And Aaron says, this golden calf is Yahweh. They, they, they want to worship Yahweh through this golden calf. I'm not trying to repeat myself. I just want to make sure you understand this. Because I bring this point up because for as long as mankind has been alive on earth, people have worshipped other gods. And sometimes they even mix the two. In their worshipping of God Almighty, they fashion a golden calf and say, see, it's the same thing. Now, we don't have many golden calf worshipping religions in the world today, or at least not that I know of. We might somewhere, I don't know. 10,000, there's possibly one of them that worships a golden calf. I'm just saying. But we do have people who say all religions are the same and they're all worshiping the same God. We just call this God by this name and they call it by that name. But we're all worshiping him but in the different ways. But it's all the same and it is not. When Moses comes down from the mountain and sees what's going on, his anger burns. He punishes the people. And when Moses speaks to God about it, God sends a plague against the people. So I want to make sure that you understand this, that worshiping Yahweh by means of another God is an abomination. It's blasphemous. It's, it's just plain wrong. It's sinful. This idea of the living God being thrown into the mix of all the other gods and religions in the world is utterly ridiculous and it's intellectually lazy. And that's the bottom line about this. What's the deal with other religions? Why are there 10,000 religions in the world? It, it's sadly simple. People follow their own desires rather than seeking the truth. Our hearts and our minds are too easily led away from the truth. 
the secular answer to all these religions is that our cultures and our societies, our own psychology wants us and needs us something to worship. Someone to blame when things go wrong. Something to place our hope in when we need a crutch. So we have, as a society, fabricated these gods and religions to fill that void. And what these experts don't tell us is why we have that void to begin with. Why are we trying to fill something there? So rather than seek the truth, they just throw it all in the same box and say it's all fake. Now, briefly, I want to share with you three significant things that set Christianity apart from all the other religions in the world. Judaism, because it is from the same God, does have a lot of similarities to this, but um, that's for another day. And, and I just want to just say plainly, Christianity stands alone. There are a lot of significant differences between Christianity and the religion, the other religions of the world, but, but I want to point these three out. The Bible, and included in that, the teachings of Jesus, rightly describe the world in which we live and have lived since the Garden of Eden. It gives the answer to why people are the way they are, why the world is the way it is. Sin and evil in the human heart. Many religions have as their goal the betterment of the human race in the world. We're going to show you how to be a better person. We're going to improve you and lift you up and build you up. Most of the Eastern religions, Hinduism, uh, Jainism, Sikhism, Buddhism, have this idea of karma, that you should live a good life so that you will come back in a better life, and in so doing, you make the world a better place. But Christianity teaches that when we reject God, when we disobey, when we leave Him, we can expect trouble. And human history is full of this story. I wish somebody would start asking about all of these mass shooters. Did they go to Sunday school as a child? I would like to know some statistics on that. I'm not saying that none of them never have, but I would really like to know how many of these crazed people in the world left God as opposed to never being around him at all. I, I just wish somebody would do that. Our hearts are bent on selfishness and self-determination. We want what we want. We want to do what we want to do. And as a result, we do the wrong things. This is why there is sin and this is why there is evil. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart, the Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. <laughs> Who can understand it? How true that is in our world. This truth is all through the Bible as well as in history. Nowhere in Christianity do we find, do better, try harder. Instead, we read about our need for God in our lives, that He alone is our hope. Many other religions are about how to fix ourselves. Christianity tells us quite plainly we cannot. We are broken and cannot be fixed apart from God's grace. Here's another place where Christianity stands alone. And that is in forgiveness and redemption. Now, other religions have the concept of forgiveness. It's not wholly unique to Christianity, although I believe the kind of forgiveness Christianity talks about is unique. But, but let's save that for another time. But I want to focus this morning on this idea of redemption. The story of the prodigal son is a great illustration of this. Jesus tells this story to illustrate something about God, the God of the Bible and Christianity. You probably know the story, but if not, come back next year because I'm going to do um, some stuff out of the Gospel of Luke and we're going to cover the prodigal son, okay? But that's not until next year. You'll have to come back for that, okay? I'm not telling you which Sunday. Come back every Sunday until that Sunday, okay? That way you'll know. You'll make sure not to miss it, all right? A man had two sons, and the younger son asked for his inheritance before the father died. Unthinkable. It was disrespectful, to say the least, to the Jewish audience that Jesus tells this story. The story should have ended right there. The, the, the younger son comes and asks his father to, 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 for his inheritance, and the father should have given his son a good thrashing right there at the end of story, and they would have clapped and said, what a great story, Jesus, you're right, right? But the story doesn't end there, okay? Instead, the father gives the boy his money, and the boy takes off and squanders it. That's a great word. He squandered it. He blew it all on wild and outrageous, sinful living. 
And then it wasn't as though the boy had an attack of conscience. He didn't go, oh, I feel so bad. I treated my father wrong. No, 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 no. That's not what happens. He runs out of money. And because he runs out of money, he runs out of friends and he runs out of food. So he ends up slopping pigs. And again, this is a made-up story, but Jesus you know, puts this in the story. And for a Jew to be slopping pigs, I mean, there, there's, there's, there's hardly anything lower that you can imagine. They, they've got to be shocked out of their mind. And while he's slopping pigs, he's like, you know what? My father's servants are better off than this. I should go home and apologize to my dad and see if he'll take me on as a, as a hired servant. Now comes the thrashing, right? The boy comes back and, and we're ready for it. The father sees him and turns his back on him. But that's not what happens. I mean, he's earned it. He's a scoundrel, a sinner with a capital S. But notice what Jesus says. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. This would have shocked the crowd. This was so foreign to them, even to the Jews. That boy should have gotten what he deserved, but he doesn't. The father should have, should have just turned his back on him and waited for the boy to beg and beg and beg to come back. Just to be a servant. But he doesn't. The father runs to him. And, and listen, Jewish men did not run. Not because they're old and, and they just didn't. It was undignified. They did not. It, it, this is a, it's a historical fact that Jewish men, they, they, it's out of character for them to do this. Now, next year when I preach on this, you need to pretend like it's the first time you heard it, okay? So just, you know. You see, Christianity isn't just about forgiving our sins. It's about redemption. God not only forgives us, but He reinstates us. He makes us clean. He makes us whole. He makes us right. He restores us. There's not another religion in the world, unless it's plagiarizing Christianity, that talks about this. That talks about, you're broken, but I will fix you, I will mend you, and I will bring you back, and I will embrace you. It is unique. We've been forgiven, and we've been redeemed. And so this follows this is another big one that sets Christianity apart, and that is that Christianity has a love like no other. It's true that Christians have been given the command to love one another, and and that the golden rule, do not do to others, you would have them do to you, are special and unique and set us apart. Oh, by the way, th this really irks me, okay? I'm going to go back to this, all right? This picture, I showed it to you earlier. Came across this. It shows the different religions, including Christianity, is all having their core, the golden rule. This is what ties them all together. Oh, it makes me so angry. <laughs> the golden rule, while not central to Christianity, <laughs> is original to Christ. These are the words of Jesus, not of Shiva, not of Buddha, not of Muhammad, or any of them. It is not the common denominator. Now, people might think it is, but it's not. You know, Confucius says, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. And Jesus is like, I, I go one better. You do to others how you want them to do to you. He is the author of the golden rule, not these other religions. And so when they put that up there, man, that just irks me. That they would take this, this thing that Jesus said and say, oh, see, all religions are the same. Notice what sets us apart. Okay, let me get back to this. All right, sorry. Only in the Christian faith do we have the God of the universe sacrificing his son for us. And us being sinful, ungrateful, selfish, disobedient people. Christianity teaches very clearly that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christianity doesn't say, I get your act together, sacrifice here, do this, give that. And once you achieve this level, then God will accept you in. No, Christianity says you can't get there on your own at all. As a matter of fact, when you're the worm on the ground groveling, that's when God loves you. That's when you need it. No other so-called God of any other religion did that so that we could be close to him, period. No other religion has this as part of it. Read it with me. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. To condemn the world. That's not why he come, why he came. But in order that the world might be saved through him. No. All religions are not the same. Christianity is not about making us into better people and making the world a better place. Yes, we teach holiness and morality, love your neighbor, do good to others, things that other people would define as good and making the world a better place, but that's not Christianity's goal or purpose. It's a side effect, it's a byproduct, but this is not what Christianity is about. It's about a God, the creator of the universe, who is our Father, who knowing that we would choose to disobey him rather than leaving us to slop pigs, runs to us, throws his arms around our filthy, stinking body and embraces us, kisses us, forgives us and restores us. That's what Christianity is about. All right, so we talked about religions. Why are there so many religions in the world? Because there are so many people who don't reject God, who just reject God, all right? Let's talk about denominations, all right? Now, I don't put these together for any reason other than there are so many people who say the same kinds of things. Aren't they the same? Is there any difference? Let me put it to you this way. While there are about 10,000 religions in the world, it is estimated that there are about 200 Christian denominations in the U.S. and a whopping 45,000 denominations globally. 45,000 Christian denominations. Well, I saved this just for this moment. My dad called and said, that when I asked about things that are divided, the thing he said he popped in his head was the church. The church is divided, which is exactly what I'm preaching on this morning. So I didn't put it in the top part. I saved it for here because 45,000 denominations. 200 is bad enough, right? have a hard time wrapping my mind around all of that. Why are there so many different denominations? And, and does it really matter anyway? I mean, don't we all love and follow Jesus? If, if that was true, then there wouldn't be 45,000 denominations, right? If, if we just all would agree on Jesus, we wouldn't have 45,000. We wouldn't have 200 in the U.S. I, I wish... That were not the case, but sadly it, it is. For this, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. One of these days I like to preach through 1 Corinthians, but, but I, I, I use it so often I feel like it'd be redundant, but we may go through 1 Corinthians one of these days soon. I've told you many times before, Paul writes this letter to the Corinthian church primarily to correct problems in the church in Corinth, and they got a bunch of them. And this is the first one, and he launches into it in verse 10. Now, they didn't have verse numbers back then, but very early in his letter, he launches into the first problem, all right? Starting at verse 10 down to verse 17, and keep your Bibles open because in verse 23, I'm going to show you that at the very end of, of, of the service, uh, what I'm going to say this morning, and we're going to look at verse 23, but I, I won't have that on the screen, but keep your Bibles open. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and there be no divisions among you. But that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul. Or I follow Apollos. Or I follow Cephas, Peter. Or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius so that none may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas beyond that. I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now I highlighted the main point here and this is what I want us to see. The problem in the Corinthian church, or at least this problem, because they had many problems in the Corinthian church, was that there were divisions within the church. People were aligning themselves according to loyalty to different people, not to Christ alone. And there's little confusion there. Is there a fourth group of saying, hey, I belong to Christ? And I don't know, maybe they were going like that, you know, 
Well, I belong to Paul. Well, I belong to Christ. You know, in a kind of a, you know, whoop de doo kind of thing. I don't know. We don't know because we, he didn't tell us that. Or, or maybe Paul was just making the point. We don't know. It doesn't really matter. The, the, the problem was there were divisions in the church. And it's not just petty things. It was causing problems in the church. I didn't put that up for you, did I? Sorry. There it is. Now listen, in the first century, there were not different denominations. There was just one church. Although they were in different congregations in different cities. There was this church in Corinth and Rome and Ephesus and Colossae and Philippi. And, and very likely in some of the bigger cities and probably the church in Corinth, as the church grew, there were many different house churches. They couldn't all meet together all the time. And so the, the church in Corinth met in different people's houses, but it was the church in Corinth meeting in different places. And I don't know, but it seems like maybe they started congregating around who had baptized them. I, I follow Apollos, so let's all meet over here and we're going to be students of Apollos. And Paul writes them and says, are you nuts? Jesus Christ is who you follow. Is Christ divided? No, of course not. Paul says, stop it. And this is the problem with many and most denominations. One word, division. In the upper room, just before Jesus goes to Gethsemane and to the cross, I mean, this is a crucial and critical time, Jesus prays. And one of the things he prays about is this very thing. Four times in this passage, I've got three on the screen up there, but there's one in verse 11 before this. Four times Jesus prays that they would be one. Four times. It seems like this is something that Jesus really, 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 really wants, right? That there be unity. I don't know how 200 different denominations in the U.S. and 45,000 worldwide comes close to giving Jesus what he wants. So what's the problem? Why are there so many divisions within the body of Christ? Now, before I go any further, I want to clearly say that I am not the judge. God's not going to call me up at Judgment Day and say, Scott, what do you think? Are they saved or not saved? Okay, I, I, it, it is not, not my place to judge. I can't see in anybody's heart. I don't know anybody's status before God. I am not the arbiter of who is in and out. Now, with that said, the, I can clearly read the Bible. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Further, John writes in, in his first uh, letter that anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ is the Antichrist. So anybody who does not believe in Jesus, it's not me making a judgment. It's me just reading the Bible, okay? There are times that we do need to divide. And when there's a disagreement over the humanity and divinity of Jesus Christ, then we need to divide from them. When someone denies Jesus, refuses to believe in him, I'm not making a judgment. I'm applying what the Bible says. And there are some denominations who do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Who don't believe in the humanity and the deity of Jesus. And that's an easy call. If you do not believe in the Son of God, I cannot call you my brother in Christ, can I? doesn't mean that you're my enemy or that I hate you or, or want to do harm to you, but it does mean that you're not going to substitute preach for me when I'm on vacation, okay? If you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, I'm not going to give you this pulpit. I'm not going to turn you over to my kids and say you can teach the class even though you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. No, that's not going to happen. And I'm not going to align with a denomination that does not hold the highest po possible view of Jesus. Let me make this distinction, too. When I'm talking about denominations, I'm speaking about the organization, not your neighbor down the street. There are many people who are part of a denomination who do not believe totally in what the guys at the headquarters are saying. There's a difference between the people who attend a denominational church and the leaders of that denomination who are making decisions and determining doctrine for the denomination, which is another problem with the denominations. Is there's people somewhere else making decisions for everybody else and saying, this is what you're going to believe. Let me give you an example. Right now, the United Methodist Church is a, 
good example of this. It's a bad example, but it's a good example of this. For the past two years, they've been in turmoil and have recently split into at least three, maybe more, factions, mainly over the question of homosexuality and should they ordain ministers who are homosexual. The leadership and the leadership decisions of the United Methodist Church do not always align with what the members of the United Methodist Church believe on both sides of the issue. Which is why some broke away to become the Liberation Methodist Connection. And others broke away to become the Global Methodist Church. And some remain. Again, I'm not picking on the Methodists, but I'm using this as a current and clear example. But I'm going to come back to them in just a moment for another example. So when I'm, for the most part, when I'm talking about denominations, I'm talking about the leadership aspect, not your next door neighbor, okay? So I'm not picking on your next door neighbor who goes to the denominational church. I, I'm just saying that this is part of the problem with denominations. And when a denomination has a question about who Jesus is, that's a problem. Here's another one, the Bible, the Word of God. It is infallible, it is inerrant, it is the absolute authority. And when a denomination does not hold the word of God in that high esteem, it should be a big old red flag to us. And many do not. Many denominations think the Bible is fluid, that it needs to change, and that it's flexible. They have ignored the warning of Jesus himself. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. And Jesus condemns the Pharisees for teaching their own doctrines and traditions as if they were the same or maybe even more important than the Word of God. That's Matthew 15, 9 and Mark 7, 8. Now listen, we may not see eye to eye on predestination or the tribulation or some of the other finer points. But if you don't have a high regard for the Bible, if you don't believe it's the Word of God, or if you decide to play fast and loose with the words to, to defend your position then you will not, should not hold a position of leadership and influence in the church. This is one of the problems with the United Methodist Church. And this is not my commentary on it. This is, now it's from Wikipedia, so take that for what it's worth. But from their page on what they believe about the Bible, the Bible is the inspired word of God. F. Belton Joyner, who is a, a retired uh, UMC minister who wrote a book uh, about being Methodist in today's culture, argues that there is a deep division within Methodism today about what exactly this means. Questions include whether the Bible was inspired when written, and the text today is always true without error, or if it's inspired when actually read by a Christian and therefore dependent upon the interaction with the reader. In other words, inspired may be, it's inspired to you. And what you think about it, what you feel about it is what's true. Again, this is not my opinion of the United Methodist Church. I'm, I'm not picking on them. They're just a good example right now, or a bad example um, uh, right now. But there are a lot of denominations who think that, that the Bible is whatever you want it to be. One last example of what we need to, or when we need to separate from some denominations, and that's when sin... When sin is flaunted. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, same book, a few pages over. Paul tells the church they need to kick out an immoral person who is boasting about his sexual immorality. You can go and read that if you want. I'm not going to have time for that this morning. We all sin. The difference is in 1 Corinthians 5 that they were celebrating the sin, not repenting from it. There are denominations who have chosen to ignore the word of God on sin. A lot of it has to do with sexual sin. Almost all of it has to do with sexual sin. But there are some others out there. Here's another example. Another bad example. The Southern Baptist Convention has been in the news lately for, for bad reasons. They, how they mishandled allegations of sexual abuse and misconduct. And it's made them look very bad in the public eye. For, for a couple of decades they, they covered up and withheld and didn't discipline Leaders in the church who had sexual problems. Again, maybe they weren't celebrating it, but they certainly weren't disciplining people. They were letting these ministers go to other churches 
and continue their behavior. As a result, a lot of people have a bad view of the Southern Baptist Convention, and some churches have decided to distance themselves from because of this scandal. I'm not saying either one is in the right on this. I'm just illustrating that sometimes when there's a moral issue, when sin is obvious and nothing is done about it, then there needs to be a divide. To be clear, we cannot side with sin, but we do need to side with repentance and reconciliation, but not with sin. So why does all this matter? What's the big deal about denominations and other religions? I'm not going to tell you that I have all the answers or that Gaston Christian Church or any other Christian church is 100% right. I hope that we are. I want to be. But like every other church and denomination, we are led by sinners saved by grace who have not yet mastered being holy 100% of the time. I, I sin, Bob and Jeff sin, our elders, they are not perfect men. Their wives are not perfect wives. Well, my wife is, but I had to say that. No, I'm, 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 I shouldn't really joke about that. We are all sinners, and so we all, we all goof up. No church is perfect. We have that standard. Nobody's ever going to be able to do anything, but... We do believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We do believe that the Bible to be the Word of God, and it's our sole authority. We do believe that sin is wrong, even when we are guilty of it. So this matters because our enemy is Satan, and he wants to pull us away from God, and he will use anything at his disposal, including confusion and division and disunity, as his tools to do that. All of those voices, all of those people saying that all religions are the same, that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you love Jesus. And by love, they don't mean obey him. They just mean, I don't know what they mean by him. That's why this matters. Second reason it matters is because we need to be on guard against false teachers and false teaching. Now listen, sometimes people get things wrong. That's unfortunate. We're not perfect. I, you know, I really try hard when I'm talking about the Bible to make sure that I share with you correct, accurate information. Occasionally, I goof something up. You know, I'll say Moses was on the ark instead of Noah, okay? You know, I'm not trying to mislead you. I'm just, I'm just fallible, okay? Sometimes it's a little more egregious than that, but it's not on purpose. But other times, there's a deliberate plan, to ch- not for me, From others, a deliberate plan to change the word of God and do damage to sound doctrine. The Bible teaches that we, us, it's our responsibility to examine what the Bible says. What's being taught and compare it to what the Bible says. Not every preacher, not every church, not every denomination is faithful to the word of God. So this matters because we, you, need to be on guard against false teaching. And just because some religious leader somewhere says something doesn't make it right. And here's the last reason. Jesus wants us to be united in him. Not around man-made creed or a set of guiding principles. As good as they may be, not aligned to a particular teacher or preacher. Even if it's Paul or Peter or Apollos or an angel from heaven. That is not where our allegiance lies. In in verse 23 of of chapter 1 of of 1 Corinthians here, Paul says, But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. How true is that still today? But to those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. My appeal has always come to Jesus Christ. Not to some set of beliefs, not to some set of doctrines, but to the man Jesus Christ who died for your sins and rose again. If you've never confessed him as your Lord and Savior, we want to give you that opportunity to have your your sins washed away uh, in Christian baptism. We're going to sing um, our, our closing song. And if you have a decision to make public, just meet me down front. Let's stand together.
much for being here this morning. Just want to uh, highlight a couple of things for you. Um, Joel's wife, Mary Beth, had surgery this week to, to fix some stuff. She's doing, doing okay? Still pretty sore about all that. All right. But keep Mary Beth in your prayers. Um, Shane and Vicki Huff are sick. Uh, she texted me yesterday. Shane got so sick, he was dehydrated, had to go to the hospital. He's in Pineville, uh, or at least he was as of yesterday. I haven't gotten an update on, on him today. Um, but keep them in your prayers. Um, um, and um, we had others in our, uh, our, our congregation have lost some, some family members and, uh, and things go on. Shane's uh, cousin passed away last Sunday, um, and David Tullery's uh, 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 uncle passed away this past week. So uh, keep their family in your prayers. And then also got a, a message yesterday. Um, we, we prayed for Russ Wilkinson. It was at church camp last week working, and we came back with COVID. Um, so they're home uh, now, and uh, uh, Debbie said he wasn't, uh, he was feverish and pretty achy and all. Um, so kind of sick, so just wanted to, he's not on the prayer list, but just want to mention that to you. Let's close in prayer and we dismissed. God, you are the only true God. Though others may um, compete, they, they fall short in so many ways. And um, it is on us to tell the world that Jesus Christ loves them and that he came to save them. Father, may we be true to your word. May we follow, uh, follow it and be careful of those who do not hold it in, in high esteem. Father, may we be uh, discerning. Uh, of those truths. Keep us safe as we go home. We lift up those on our prayer list that need your help for, for Russ and Debbie and pray that they get well soon. And for Mary Beth as she recovers from her surgery and Shane and Vicki, um, pray that they get well very soon as well. Thank you for your son and for your love, for your grace. We pray this in his name. Amen.